man. Speaking as a, as a woman who has read your book, and I'm with you for, for so much of it, and then you start to lose me when you talk about archetypes. Mm -hmm. The way you talk about archetypes in the book, and again, forgive me if I'm being slightly imprecise, but I'm trying to gloss it for an audience who might not have read it, is that in this sort of Jungian archetypal world, chaos is feminine, order is masculine, and the subtitle of your book is an antidote to chaos. Mm -hmm. So as a woman reading that, you know, I'd like for you to explain to me, maybe, what I'm missing there, because that's when you started to lose me a little bit as a reader. Why does there need to be an antidote to the feminine in that way? Well, th there has to be an antidote to anything that's manifesting itself in excess. And it's chaos that's manifesting itself in excess at the moment in our culture. Um, and, so, and so that's what I decided to address in this book. And mostly that was because, I suppose, it was addressed at least in part to younger people. And what younger people have to contend with, generally speaking, is an excess of chaos because they're not very disciplined. And so you need to, you know, we kind of have this idea that while well, you're free as a child and then you, let me see if I, can, if I can put this properly, that you have a certain delightful, wonderful, positive freedom as a child and then that's given up as you approach adulthood. But the truth of the matter is, is that you have a lot of potential as a child, but none of that is capable of manifesting itself as freedom before you become disciplined. And discipline is a matter of the imposition of order, and the order is necessary, especially for people who are hopeless and nihilistic. And lots of people are hopeless and nihilistic, way more people than you think. And part of that is because no one's ever really encouraged them. And so the book is in part a matter of encouragement. It's like, lay yourself, lay a disciplinary structure on yourself, get the chaos in, in, in check, and then you can move towards a state that's freer, because it's discipline first. Like, look, if you're gonna become a concert pianist, there's going to be several thousand hours of extraordinarily disciplined practice. That's the imposition of order on your potential, let's say. But what comes out of that is a much grander freedom. And so in virtually every freedom that you have in life that's true freedom is purchased at the price of discipline. And so because I think that it's, it's nihilism and, and hopelessness that constitute the major existential threat, especially to young people at the moment, then I was concentrating on the necessity of discipline and order. So, and the issue with regards to the metaphysical or symbolic representation of chaos as feminine, well, that's a very complex problem. And the first thing you have to understand is that there's no a priori supposition that order is preferable to chaos in any fundamental sense. They're both constituent elements of reality. You can't say one's bad and the other's good. You can say that they can become unbalanced, and that's definitely not good. Too much chaos is not good. Obviously, too much order is not good. Equally obviously, those are the two extremes that you have to negotiate between. And I'm not making a casual claim with regards to the idea that reality is an amalgam of chaos and order. I don't think that there is any more accurate way of describing the nature of reality. That's the most fundamental, maybe not the most fundamental truth, but it's certainly, there's, there's, two, there's two fundamental truths. Reality is composed of chaos and order, and your role is to mediate between them successfully. That's metaphysical and symbolic truth, but it's more than that, because that's actually how your mind and your brain is organized, not only conceptually, but emotionally, motivationally, and physiologically. So, and I don't really understand how that can be, because it isn't obvious to me how the most fundamental elements of reality can be chaos and order, but the evidence that that is the case is overwhelming. I can give you a quick example, um, which is quite interesting. So you have two hemispheres. There's a reason for that. The fundamental reason for that is that one of them is adapted for things you don't understand. That's roughly speaking the right hemisphere. And the other is adapted for things that you do understand. That's the left hemisphere. And so that's a chaos order dichotomy. And the fact that you're adapted to that, that, you're, that the very structure of your brain reflects that bifurcation indicates, as far as I can tell, beyond a shadow of a doubt, 
because it's also characteristic of non-human animals, many of them, that that differentiation is fundamentally true in some sense. Now you might ask, well, why is that conceptualized as masculine versus feminine? Because it's not male versus female. By the way, those are not the same thing, because one's conceptual. Um, that's extraordinarily complicated. I think the reason is, is that we're social cognitive primates, and that our fundamental cognitive categories, a priori cognitive categories, are masculine, it's masculine, feminine, and child. It's something like that. That's the fundamental structure of reality because we're social creatures and we view reality as something that's essentially social in its nature. And then when we started to conceptualize reality outside the social world, which wasn't very long ago, by the way, and which is something that animals virtually don't do at all, we used those a priori social categories as filters through which we interpreted the external world. And we're sort of stuck with that in some deep sense. And you might say, well, why do we have to be stuck with that? It's like, well, because some things are very difficult to change. Like if you go watch a story and the characters in this story slot themselves into those archetypal categories, then you'll understand the story. And if they don't, you won't. Because your understanding is predicated on application of the archetypal a priori's to the story. You wouldn't understand it otherwise. So you can't get under that. There's no under that. Not, not, and not to remain human. So, and I can give you a quick, a quick example. Um, I like to use Disney movies for a variety of reasons, mostly because everybody knows them. But it's not accidental that the evil queen, the evil queen in Sleeping Beauty is not an accidental character. She's the way she is because we understand her. And the reason we understand her is because we see the world through the categories that I just laid out. And you can say, well... But are you saying she has to be a queen and not a king? No, if she was an evil king, she'd be different. Mm -hmm. She'd be like Scar in The Lion King. He just as evil, man, but not the same character. Right? Yeah. I guess I'm struck that it seems like a lot of your intellectual project is reasserting difference in an age where... We're told that everything is the same. Yeah, but and it's, that it's almost it's indecent to say. Okay. <laughs> well, look, look. I'm, I'm gonna, it, it, I, sorry to be so blunt, but look, the problem, the problem with some of this, the problem with some of this, some of it's willful blindness, but some of it's just ignorance. So let me just let me just lay out a couple of things. So, for example, I've been taken to task along, let's say, with James Damore, who had actually been highly influenced by my videos before he. And, and my classes before he did what he did at Google. You know, I've studied personality differences between men and women for 25 years and written papers on the topic. And it's actually an area of expertise of mine and substantial expertise too. And not pseudoscience expertise, thank you very much. I'm not a pseudoscientist. <laughs> so my publication record puts me in the top 0.5% of psychologists. So I'm not a pseudoscientist by any stretch of the imagination. And I have 10,000 citations. And that's not a million, but it's a lot, and a hundred published papers. So, so let me lay out one of the, the personality differences between men and women, because it's worth understanding. And, and you might say, well, there can't be personality differences between men and women, because that's anti-feminist. It's like, no, it's not. We might have to actually understand that there are differences between men and women, so that we can let men and women make the choices they're going to make without, without subjecting them to undue manipulation. Okay, so. One of the reliable differences between men and women, cross-culturally, is that men are more aggressive than women. Now, what's the evidence for that? Here's one piece of evidence. There are ten times as many men in prison. Now, what's that, a sociocultural construct? It's like, no, it's not a sociocultural construct. Okay, here's another piece of data. Women try to commit suicide more than men, by a lot, and that's because women are more prone to depression and anxiety than men are. And there's reason for that, and that's cross-culturally true as well. They're more likely to try to commit suicide, but men are way more likely to actually commit suicide. Why? Hmm. Because they're more aggressive, so they use lethal means. Okay, so now the question is, how much more aggressive are men than women? And the answer is, not very much. So the claim that men and women are more the same than different is actually true. But this is where you have to know something about statistics to actually understand the way the world works. Instead of just applying your a priori ideological presupposition to things that are too complex to fit in that rubric. So, 
if you if you drew two people out of two people out of a, a crowd, one man and one woman, and you had to lay a bet on who was more aggressive, and you bet on the woman, you'd win 40% of the time. Okay, so that's quite a lot. It's not 50% of the time, which would be no differences whatsoever, but it's quite a lot. So there's lots of women who are more aggressive than lots of men. So, so the, the curves overlap a lot. So there's way more similarity than difference. And this is along the dimension where there's the most difference, by the way. Right? But here's the problem. You can take small differences at the average of a distribution. The distributions move off to the side. And then all the actions at the tail. So here's the situation. You don't care about how, how aggressive the average person is. It's not that relevant. What you care about is who is the most aggressive person out of 100. You take 100 people and you take the most aggressive person because that's the person you better watch out for. And what's the gender? Men. Because if you go three standard deviations out from the mean, on two curves that overlap but are slightly dis disjointed, then you derive an overwhelming preponderance of the overrepresented group. And that's why men are about ten times more likely to be in prison. It has nothing to do with socialization. So, and then, and, and then there are other differences too. So, um, it turns out that differences in aggression and agreeableness also predict differences in interest. And so it turns out that men are more interested, on average, than in things than women are, and women are more interested in people on average, and that's actually the biggest difference that's been measured between men and women. It's nothing to do with ability. It has to do with interest. And so the way that manifests itself is that women are more likely to go into uh, disciplines that are characterized by the care of others, and you can tell that by the way occupations are segregating. All you have to do is look at the data for like 15 minutes. Women overwhelmingly dominate healthcare. And that's, that's accelerating, by the way. And men dominate engineering, let's say. And so you say, well, that's sociocultural. It's like, no, it's not. And here's the proof. So, so now, now what you do, because you want to test this hypothesis, right? It's like, and, believe, and the other thing that you want to understand is that left-leaning psychologists generated this data. And you think, well, how do you know that? That's easy. There are no right-leaning psychologists. <laughs> Except for you. Well, that's what people say, you know. And so, well, so I'm on stage with and, the only and, one. And that's been well documented. <laughs> and so people have published this data despite their ideological proclivities and despite the fact that this is not what they expected to find or what they wanted to find. So what you do now is you, you stack countries by how egalitarian their social policies are. Right, from the least egalitarian to the most. And you say, well, the Scandinavian countries are the most egalitarian. And by the way, if we don't agree on that, then there's no sense having this discussion at all because we don't agree on what egalitarian means. If you don't think that what the Scandinavians have done ha has been a move in the direction of egalitarianism, then I have no idea what you mean by egalitarianism. Now, you could say, well, they haven't done it perfectly. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's true. But it's not <laughs> relevant to this argument. So what you do is you stack countries by how egalitarian their social policies are, and then you look at occupational and personality differences between men and women as a function of the country. And what you find is, as the country becomes more egalitarian, the differences between men and women increase. They don't decrease. And so what that means is that the radical social constructionists are wrong. And it's not a few studies with a couple of people done by some half-witted psychologists in some tiny little university. It's population level studies that have been published in major journals that have been cited by thousands of people. It's not pseudoscience. It's not, it's not, questioned, it's not questioned by mainstream psychometricians and personality theorists. We figured this out back in like 1995. Everyone thought it was settled. And so what's the big problem? Well, who knows what the big problem is? The outcome is not exactly the same between the genders. It's like, well, who says it has to be? And more importantly, and this is something to ask yourself constantly, just who the hell is going to enforce that? And just exactly how are they going to enforce that? And believe me, it's not going to be in some manner that you like. Because there are differences between men and women. And if you leave them alone, 
those differences manifest themselves in different occupational choices. That's the other finding. This is a newer one. As the societies become more egalitarian, the occupational choices between men and women maximize. And what that means is that fewer and fewer women go into the STEM fields. Now, no one wanted that. No one predicted it. No one was hoping for it. It actually flew in the face of, I would say, the most established psychological theories, because my presupposition certainly was 20 years ago that what would have happened as we made societies more egalitarian would be that men and women would converge. That's not what happened. The biological differences maximized as we eliminated the sociocultural differences. And so, maybe you don't like that. It's like, that's fine with me. I didn't say I liked it. But the, whether or not I like a piece of data has very little bearing on whether or not I'm liable to accept it. You know, I'm trying to look at the damn scientific literature and to draw the conclusions that are necessitated by the data. And then you can say, well, the whole thing is suspect because it's the, it's the construction of the patriarchal tyrants who generated the Eurocentric scientific viewpoint. It's like, you want to have that conversation, then go to an activist discipline and have it. Because it's not the sort of conversation that anyone sensible would engage in. So. Um, I'd love to open up the room to questions. 